Jiro here for Umber Games with a review of Zeo Drifter, available digitally first on Nintendo 3DS and Windows in 2014, ported to Wii U, PlayStation 4, and Vita digitally in 2015, before finally landing on Nintendo Switch in February of 2018. I actually purchased a physical copy from Limited Run Games that went up for sale by the online retailer in mid-2016. Zeo Drifter was developed by Renegade Kid, but when the studio shut down in 2016, they split rights to their games, and Zeo Drifter went to Jules Watson and his company called a Tui. I'd started following Watson on Twitter in my search to stay on top of all the games coming out, and seeing the tweets about Zeo Drifter releasing the Switch and his passion for game design made opening my PS4 copy a priority, so here we are. Zeo Drifter is what many in the industry call a Metroidvania. I personally hate the term, as some of you know by now, and instead choose to classify this game as an adventure, open world, item procedural. In the intro, your space person gets marooned in a distant system and must travel to the four nearby planets to find a way to get his warp drive restored. You can visit each planet in any order you like, using an asteroids-like control scheme, coming and going as you please. But, like the genre does, you'll only be able to access areas by finding the necessary upgrade. You can move your astronaut left and right, and you can shoot in three directions while standing. You can also shoot downward by jumping and pointing down. If you hold down while on the ground, you can lie down, which can be necessary when combating some enemies. There's one strength of jump, so once you press the button, you've committed to a full arc, which isn't a mechanic I usually touch on, but it can become extremely important in some combat strategies, especially against the game's bosses. You begin with three life dots and a small pea shooter, but through the discovery of hidden rooms and chambers can increase your total life and gun power. You reach each planet by taking a teleporter from your ship, where there's also a life replenishing save point. Should you die on the planet's surface, you'll return here, and unless you're at the checkpoint outside of boss rooms, you'll lose all progress since your last save, including power-ups you've collected since you left the ship. This does add some difficulty to the game, but I often find the difficulty in situations like this refreshing. It can really change the way you play, if you're not invincible and stand to lose something. In a lot of games like this, if there were a temporary checkpoint, you might find yourself running quickly through the territory you would just tread a bit recklessly to get back to where you were, but Zeo Drifter requires you to maintain your caution as you retread the lost ground. The way forward, and which planet should you tackle next, isn't always obvious, until you've reached that barrier. But if you're observant, you can also judge by things like how many shots the enemy in front of you is taking, which can help you see relative difficulty. You may want to find more life or gun power-ups before continuing. The gun upgrade is one place this game really shines. The weapon power-ups you obtain can be applied modularly to one to five different types of power-ups. The best part is they can be removed and reapplied. So if you're not happy with a certain configuration you've made, you can change it. This also increases the player's desire and ability to experiment. To take that one step further, you can actually even save up to three presets that you can flip from the pause menu. There is auto-mapping, like Super Metroid used to do, and it seemed odd to me at first that it showed all the planets at once, but again with the nature of the pixels and thinking of this being first on 3DS, it kind of makes sense. Being able to switch between weapon presets on a touchscreen would have been kind of fun too. With one of the main progressional power-ups, you actually have to pause and go to this screen every time you want to activate it on PS4. Now, it's not a major issue, but it is one of the only power-ups that is an exception to the rule in this way, it would have been nice if it was just mapped to a button press. There are a couple of abilities that are unique for the genre. Upon reaching a giant wall I had no way to climb, I assumed I'd be getting a big jump or some such, only to receive a phase shifter that allows you to move into the background and climb in what I thought was just there for decoration. Another concept that works really well with the 3D capabilities of the 3DS. Enemy variety is one possible weakness of this game. I mean, this is an indie title, made by a smaller studio, and the entire game can be finished initially in 3-5 to five hours. In fact, there's even a trophy for speedrunning the game in under an hour. So the intention was more of a purely distilled, bite-sized experience. But aesthetically, even the game's bosses don't see much variety with a palette swap each time. They do gain new challenging abilities for you to analyze and assess the pattern, so from a mechanical standpoint, it still works. The bosses can be challenging, especially the first one where you have no upgrades, but a different sprite set here just would have added a bit more excitement. Graphically, the game harkens back to the 8-bit days, as you can see. I play on a 4K, 75-inch TV, making the pixels of the game pretty giant. Being as it was first developed and intended for Nintendo 3DS though, the zoom in perspective and giant pixels do make sense. Overall, the game is a great tribute to 8-bit games of the past, bringing back some very definite feelings of playing games like the original Metroid. The play control is reliable and consistent. Figuring out where to go without waypoints or marks on the map is refreshing. The gun upgrade system is fun to experiment with. The abilities you obtain have some uniqueness. And the hidden stuff is pretty fun to find. While the bestiary does run a bit lean, all bosses, while mechanically challenging, are just a palette swap, and there's a bit of a challenge, so be prepared for returning to save points upon death. When one of your biggest complaints of the game is that there isn't enough of it and you want more of it, then you could definitely do worse. Rated as a 2D item procedural, Zeo Drifter lands at a 71 on the plus side of average on my true 1 to 100 scale, with 50 being an average game. This is Jiro for Umber Games. Thanks for watching. Everyone needs some retro once in a while. Subscribe to the channel for notifications of new videos as I dig through my backlog, or follow me on Twitter at Umber Games.